Okay, let's begin the webinar. I'm Michael Krigsman. I am the founder of CXO Talk, and welcome to Better Cloud's Cloud IT webinar series. Today, we're talking about social engineering, how to recognize and prevent social engineering attacks. We have an extraordinary group of people as panelists. Chris Hadnagy is the founder and C CEO of social-engineer.com. His colleague, Michelle Fincher, is the chief influencing agent of social-engineer.com. Rob Reagan is managing security associate at Bishop Fox. And Austin Whipple is a senior application security engineer at Better Cloud. Now before we dive in, let's put up a quick poll so that we get a better understanding of who's in the audience and we can make sure that the content most effectively meets your needs. So to begin, let's talk about social engineering. And Chris, let's begin with you. Give us a just a brief overview of social engineering. Hey, Chris. You'll have to, yep, you'll have to excuse me. For some reason, the whole thing was not working. I couldn't unmute. You know, that's the problem with, te with technology. And it doesn't matter how great a technologist you are, this is what we deal with. And I see we have the whole crew. So, Chris, give us a, give us a brief sense of social engineering. Sure. So, uh, we define social engineering pretty broad in general in our company. It's any act that is influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interests. And we define it broad because we don't think it's always negative. But webinars like this, we're often focusing on the attack vectors that social engineering are involved in. So we break those out into four different areas, which is phishing, vishing, or voice phishing, um, impersonation, and smishing, which is SMS phishing. Michelle, you want to add some thoughts on the social engineering problem just as, an, as a brief introduction before we go on and dig in? Sure. Thank you, Michael. I think um, one of the aspects that's important to understand about social engineering is the fact that it really exploits our human tendencies. And so the best and the most vicious social engineers and attackers will use principles of influence and manipulation to ensure they reach their goals. So despite the fact that we're safe behind our firewalls and our technology, we still have humans making end decisions. And that's what's really important to understand that this is very much a human-based problem. So the foundation of social engineering is manipulation, in effect. Oh, yes, certainly, on, on sort of the, the darkest end of it. You know, principles, we, at, at our company, we very much differentiate between influence and manipulation, and basically um, both are very powerful forms, but oftentimes, unfortunately, we do see manipulation used in the wild. So we're going to talk right now about four different types of social engineering attacks, and especially we're going to talk about how to prevent these attacks. And Chris mentioned them, so we're going to talk first about phishing, then vishing, then impersonation and other physical attacks, and finally smishing. And I wonder who comes up with these great names. So Austin, let's begin with you. Why don't you give us a brief introduction to phishing, and then we'll have a discussion about phishing before we move on to the next one. Sure. So I would say phishing would be um, electronic impersonation uh, other than over SMS. So you're using some sort of medium like email or web chats and Slack or LinkedIn notifications to kind of pretend that you're somebody that you aren't, usually to get somebody to perform some sort of end action. Whether that's downloading some binary file or going on a link or putting in your passwords or you know doing some sort of further communication to kind of move that process along. So somebody is trying to get you to take an action under false pretenses. Sure. Rob, why don't you add your thoughts to phishing? 
certainly. Um, yeah, it, it, this really is a, an ongoing uh, a threat that uh, that's not not going away, and uh, it involves um, being able to coerce someone into uh, performing an action that compromises an asset, and uh, it really does take a, uh, a strategic and holistic approach to to begin to even mitigate the, this type of a threat as uh, as it's an incident that every organization is seeing. And Austin, how, do, how does one prevent these attacks? Describe the attacks in, in more detail and, and talk a little bit about prevention. Sure. Sir, so prevention, like my sort of philosophy around prevention is put the technical controls in place that you can and then sort of identify, okay, what sort of gaps do we have now that we've got these controls. So I would say for phishing, Pretty typically what you want to do is set up um, DKIM and SPF protections around your email. So you want to make it so that it's very hard for a bad guy to impersonate somebody from inside your organization. So given that control being in place, make sure it's strong, then you want to start looking at, okay, well how do we train users to identify when like a Google Docs sharing link comes in that's not not actually from Google Docs. How do we teach them, you know, use the little drop down menu, look at who it's really from, look at the links, hover over them, see, you know, is this really pointing to docs.google.com? Am I really being redirected to accounts.google.com or am I being redirected to something that looks very convincing but isn't actually the end goal? So you do training around that and then you do testing. So there's always this sort of cycle of training and testing. So you train them, you test, you collect metrics, you identify what sort of gaps you have in your response, and then you train again, do more testing. But Chris, it sounds like these steps are, for, a, for an IT person or a technology person, this may be straightforward, but some of these phishing attacks just look so authentic. How do you, what do we do in cases where where an attack comes in and to the average person it just looks indistinguishable from a real email from, from a banker or whomever? That's a really good question, Michael. So uh, if we try to look at some of the attacks that have occurred over the last 18 months, we can see that phishing was involved in many of them. And, and at least a handful in particular, that was the main vector that was used in breaching. Um, and some of them caused a lots and lots of damage. Now. Um, some of the technological things that were mentioned, they're, they're good, but the issue is, is that there's always a way past that and around that. So your, your question is really good because even if there is no plug-in or app or um, technological advance today that can stop phishing, minus getting rid of email. <laughs> That's the way you can, <laughs> you can do it. If you want to get rid of email in your company, that will stop phishing. Uh, that will probably stop your business too, unfortunately. So what we suggest is, um, is the approach that Austin meant, mentioned at the end, which is continual training. But there's another step beyond that. Uh, if we look at a lot of the attacks that occurred, and I hate to pick on any one company, if you look at Coca-Cola just a couple years ago, they could have stopped themselves from massive loss if someone had reported the fish once they clicked it. So we're big believers in not saying if you get hacked, but when you fall for one of these scams, what is your policy? after that process? How do you educate your employees uh, what they should do after they click? So there should be an easy method for them to report so that way if they fall for this you can fix the problem before it turns into a company closing situation. So Michelle, Snapchat just this week reported that they lost payroll data due to a phishing attack. Snapchat. So from an IT perspective, can you elaborate what are the steps that we can take and that we should take on an ongoing basis? So yes, there's training, of course, but on an ongoing basis, as IT folks, what should we be doing to ensure that we do not become the next Snapchat in terms of losing our payroll data due to phishing? And we're not hearing Michelle. So, my apologies. 
technical controls with human intervention. So this is a great example. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just throw myself <laughs> under the bus. Um, the fact is you can have the best technical controls in place, and, and you should be doing the basics like whitelisting. You should be doing spam control. But when it comes down to it, any human can override any, kind of, any sort of technical control. The Coca-Cola incident occurred because the technical controls worked. The, the phishing email went to a junk folder, and a person retrieved that email out of the junk folder and opened the Excel attachment. So again, your technical controls are great and important, but the fact is humans are making these decisions, and humans are making these mistakes. And so you should be doing the basic things. You should have a firewall. You should have whitelisting. You should have email rules. However, you should also be training your people, because ultimately those are the ones that are going to be overriding those technical controls. So technical controls are not enough, but we still have to have them. So again, just uh, from an IT perspective, would somebody like to summarize the email technical controls or the technical controls that can help us prevent a phishing attack? Just a, just a quick summary. Yeah, I, I can certainly help out. Uh, some of the things that an organization can do uh, is um, set up SPF, um, which is a sender policy framework, um, but a, a lot of uh, organizations actually do not realize that this is not enough. Um, the, to, to prevent someone from spoofing messages within your organization, for example, uh, it, it basic uh, principles of SMTP and email allow anyone to uh, send an, a message and spoof the from field. So it's uh, trivial. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we've done a little bit of research and, and found that overwhelmingly 99.83% uh, of organizations can have email spoofed from their CEO to the entire workforce, um, asking them to, to perform some action seemingly on, on, from the CEO's behalf. And, uh, it, implementing uh, SPF in conjunction with DKIM and DMARC uh, is uh, a, an effective technical mechanism that can prevent that kind of spoofing. Other things that can be done um, in the capacity of improving um, the ability to respond to a social engineering incident uh, from an email perspective is making it easy for, for uh, someone at the organization to report the issue, um, perhaps setting up a, a designated alias uh, such as uh, security at, at the, the domain um, or, or even stranger danger at, at the organization's domains, something that's easy to remember and something that we can easily uh, help folks report these types of incidents. Um, other, other technical controls uh, could involve um, actually uh, disabling HTML emails. Uh, if, if the organization's uh, risk tolerance is, is to the point where they uh, don't require um, having HTML in emails, you can prevent a lot of the tricks to hide uh, malicious links or to clone email messages that look legitimate and contain a, a lot of the look and feel of, of other, uh, other um, uh, organizations' le legitimate messages. Um, and it's also possible to um, sandbox email clients and uh, or uh, allow them um, only to run with uh, least privilege uh, and limited write privileges on systems uh, that uh, if, an att if a, a victim were to launch um, an attachment uh, that contained a malicious payload, uh, you, you could help mitigate the risk by, by running um, email in a, in a sandbox. So before we go on to vishing, David Huff asks a question. He, he's a, he figures we've got a lot of uh, amazing panelists. And he says, they have SPF set up and still get a lot of spoofed phishing messages. Any thoughts on that from any of the panelists quickly before we go on to the next topic? Certainly. Yeah, SPF is um, not a great techno control, in my opinion, just because if I buy a domain, so if I go and I buy a better dash cloud and then I send an email from that as opposed to just bettercloud.com, then the domain matches the email. I'm not spoofing. But now I'm still relying on the human to realize that better dash cloud is not really better cloud, that they're different, that they're different domains, different URLs. So SPF can't figure that out because all it's doing is saying, does the email come from where it says it's coming from? And if it does, and it's not a spoofed uh, reply to or send from, then it then it doesn't then it doesn't stop it. So um, every one of those technical controls, the things are good. That you should have them. You should have them. But there's three or four different ways you can bypass each one of them uh, pretty easily. 
And so at the end of the day, it still comes down to the end user training. In my opinion, yeah. Yeah, and from a technical perspective, SPF is also designed to rely on DKIM and DMARC, and an organization would have to um, configure those components as well if they did want to prevent uh, the direct spoofing of, uh, of emails from their domain. Okay, let's move on to vishing. We could spend the entire webinar talking about phishing, uh, but let's go on to vishing. Michelle, what is vishing? Let's, let's begin there. Well, at, at a really simple level, vishing is voice solicitation, so it's using the telephone to either try to obtain information that an individual shouldn't have access to or to, to directly influence an action like a password reset. It's fairly common now, and oftentimes you see it in conjunction with other attack vectors like phishing. And in fact, uh, Jim Martin, who is listening, submitted a comment describing that that's what they're facing is vishing in combination with phishing. So the whole thing then becomes, becomes much more complicated, doesn't it, in order to detect, prevent, and control. Oh, yes, certainly, because now you're getting the same information from two different sources, and it, it is difficult for the end user to be able to determine that this isn't a legitimate request. If I, if I talk to you on the phone and if I spoof a number that appears to be legitimate, if, my, if your caller ID comes up and says that I'm calling from your bank, and then I send you an email that appears to also come from the bank, that's something that's very difficult to detect and very difficult to defend against, because now what you're doing is combining the same message from two different sources of information. Now, what about the, let's, let's talk first about specific technical measures that we can employ against vision. Well, again, the, the technical measures in my mind, particularly with companies who have clients, peop, uh, companies who have call centers, companies that have HR departments, their jobs are to answer questions and to provide information. And the only technical control really is, you know, for the telephone, it's, it's who's calling, it's caller ID. And, and those are pieces of information that can be forged quite easily um, for free, if not for, very, you know, for, for a very, very low price. And so without any sort of additional information, it is difficult for the end user to determine whether or not this is not legitimate. And again, the technical controls, we're talking about phone calls now at this point. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk now about the types of training and human techniques that are involved. Um, Chris, you wanna jump in on that one? Sure. Um, I think it comes back to a similar answer to what Austin mentioned before when it comes to phishing, um, because there is such a, there's much more technical controls with phishing than there are with, with the phone, uh, that it has to be a lot more user education and then testing. So it's, people who have never been vished might not know what they're looking for. So we, we are big um, proponents of, of advising clients to actually have vishing calls done on their employees or their call centers and then using that as pieces of education to, to show them what it felt like to be vished, what information shouldn't be given out and then from that to build educational programs inside the company uh, so they know what, to, what kind of information to give out, when it's okay to give it out and then what to do again if they fall for a vishing scam um, and what they should do after they realize that they've been vished. I have a so Rob, comment on that. Please go oh, go for it. Uh, I would say like uh, I feel like in this this is the attack where where I feel like policy comes into play. Um, employees should know that their job is not going to be on the line, or the CEO is not like if the CEO or you know the high tier customer calls and asks them to do something out of the ordinary, that the company is going to have the employees back instead of ragging on them for like why didn't you help this customer out like now we're not going to close this deal if the employee has that kind of thing in the back of their mind way more likely to help out you know this caller who may not be who they're, they say they're supposed to be so if there's kind of clear strong enforced policies and the company and the employee knows the company's going to have their back then much more likely to say no to an inappropriate request and I think one more piece of information that's critical to understand is that without, without the clear policy and without for the, the individuals being called to have a way of 
confirming the identity of the callers if that is you know somebody who provides an employee ID or somebody who provides answers to security questions again those methods can be bypassed as well um, that that policy has to be clear and the conditions under which information is, is given has to be very very clear the other piece behind that is the fact that most people don't understand the value of the information that they hold oftentimes in the services that we provide we will wish particularly for pieces of open source information first, information that gives us insight into, you know, when we do this for our clients, insight into um, types of systems that they're using or types of language that they use or even formatting of employee IDs so that lends credibility to additional calls. So the malicious attackers will all, often use a number of calls to first collect information and then to execute the attack, whether that is creating additional influence or getting additional pieces of information that might be damaging for the target. Is it possible for someone inside a company to conduct a simulated attack or does it really need, uh, really need an outside person who's, who's completely anonymous? I think it certainly it takes some, uh, a, <clears throat> a proactive approach of, of looking holistically at the, the, the people involved, the processes involved, and the policies. And someone from within an organization should certainly be uh, making uh, those bridges to the other departments and other groups uh, to work together to, to solve, uh, to help mitigate the risk of these problems. Um, in the case of, 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 uh, of a voice-based uh, social engineering, uh, um, we very often are, are conducting combinations of email-based phishing along with calling in maybe to simulate uh, a impersonate an employee, maybe we've done some pretexting and some research in, in the background to find out from Facebook that they're currently on vacation and uh, we can then uh, call in, pretend to be them and, and ask to get the, the password reset. And where we see uh, fundamental breakdowns is uh, the, the um, uh, help desk support is really just trying to be helpful. They may know the policy uh, where they're, they're not allowed to reset the password without authenticating the employee but there aren't um, applications uh, enforcing the policy and the process in front of them and they're often able to still subvert that process and we've even been able to have them, them uh, not only reset passwords for us but also give us two-factor account tokens um, just through, uh, through being convincing that we are indeed this employee that's on vacation and needs access. Um, where, where we see um, uh, internal groups that could help uh, support this is if they were able to build in controls that, that did verify more information that it may, and basically just make it more difficult for an attacker uh, and, and slow them down by any means possible, whether that's by also verify, by verifying their employee ID or last four social or just more information and, and making sure that there are good security questions in place that aren't easily researched and easily bypassed. Um, it certainly can, can be, uh, that, that type of information can be uncovered by doing um, uh, a review. Can I add Melissa, to that, Michael? Oh, please, Chris, go for it. Um, I agree with everything that was said there. I think, too, the, to answer your, your question about internal versus external, it's definitely feasible that an internal employee could conduct a vishing exercise for the company, um, but it really depends on what the goals of the, the company are, right? For, for us, when we do it externally, it's almost uh, what we would call like a black box penetration test. We don't want you to tell anything except tell us anything except for the phone numbers we're, we're allowed to call. And then from there, we try to figure out the names of internal systems, the names of um, web applications, the things that maybe an employee would slip and say the name of their HR system. And now we have that, and we would use that to build further pretext on our next vision calls. Uh, sometimes in a, the, the challenge for an internal person is not using those pieces of information up front. And when you use them up front, of course, you build trust, you build rapport right away, people feel like you're part of the crowd, so you can't prove if it would have worked previous to that. So with an external, we're trying to do calls without any information, and then we're comparing success ratios from having no information up until we have all the information that we've built over maybe several hours, weeks, months, or however long we're doing the campaign for. So. It's definitely feasible for an internal person. I guess it just depends on how um, hardcore the company is looking to test their people. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And that was precisely why I asked the question. We have, before we finish up with Vishing, we have a, an interesting question from 
Melissa Davis, who said she works with senior citizens, and that demographic is extremely susceptible. And so she's wondering, what type of quizzes are there that are, say, age-specific, whether it's her demographic or younger people? Any, any thoughts of advice for her? Yeah, I can, I can help you out with this because we actually have a bunch of clients that their parents and grandparents have been affected by this. Um, I, personally, and this is the only time you'll ever hear me say this, this is where I think user education is probably not useful because if you put your grandma or grandpa through, um, through some kind of education on vishing, they're, they're just not, it's not going to really sink in. So we, we try to take it ver to a very simplistic level, and they are under attack right now. Uh, one of the most common is, you know, hey, Grandma, I'm, no, this is Chris. I'm in Mexico. I got arrested during spring break. Can you help me out? I need some bail money, and it's not me. And, you know, don't tell Mom and Dad. I don't want them to get ticked. And Grandma, Western Union's five grand to some fake place in Mexico, and it's, and it's a scam, right? Now, now she's out money. I actually know someone who this happened to. What we set up is, um, is code words, something that Grandma would know and Grandson would know and then some clear lines of advisement, like, Grandma, I'm not, like, here's what's happening. People may call. I'm not traveling. If I'm going to travel, I'm going to give you a code word. If I need help, I'm going to say that word. Now, you're still relying on memory and things like that, so depending on the age, that could be a little tricky. Um, but it, it could save, it could just give them a little more emphasis on getting saved from these attacks. Because, again, what they're doing is they're calling, and they're relying on the fact that Grandma wants to be helpful, and she doesn't want to get the kid in trouble, and that's why she'll help with money. So in effect, you're creating a two-factor authentication system that's a very simple one. And it's not foolproof, but it, it, it has worked in quite a few instances in saving some of these poor folks from, from getting breached. You know, again, we, I, I, we could spend the entire time talking about this one topic, and it certainly is an interesting and a rich one. But let's go on to impersonation and other attacks. Rob, and I feel, I feel kind of scared, you know, as we're talking about this. You know, we go about our daily business and we're under attack in so many different ways. So, Rob, tell us about impersonation and other physical attacks. Certainly. This, this can be uh, really any type of attack where someone is misrepresenting themselves in order to gain access to sensitive assets. And uh, in a lot of cases, um, this, this may involve uh, a physical penetration test uh, to, to t try to uncover the weaknesses that uh, w where it may involve tailgating, it may involve using RFID badge cloning devices, it may involve um, gaining uh, access and, and uh, by uh, sprinkling uh, USB sticks with malicious payloads throughout uh, an office facility. Um, it may involve mailing something to someone, uh, saying it's from someone else, and, and uh, as promotional material, getting them to, to put it in their computer. And these can all result in, in, in very, uh, very detrimental um, uh, compromises and breaches to sensitive data. Uh, we'll, we'll often bypass uh, very uh, expensive uh, equipment, such as uh, fingerprint readers and biometric scanners, in order to, uh, with even some, some simple workarounds, uh, in, in one recent example, we were able to uh, bypass um, a facility's fingerprint readers just by picking the five-pin locks on the doors that uh, were required to be there by, from the fire department and the, the uh, owners of the, of the building that the, uh, the organization was leasing from. Um, so there, there, there went uh, uh, a, a very expensive um, countermeasure that, that was subverted with a very old and simple technique uh, with, uh, in a physical attack. So what do we do? Anybody? How do we, how do we solve this? Or, or solve is the wrong term. How do we address this? Ms. Schaffing, so why don't we, why don't, why don't we pick on you? <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, clearly th this, the message is going to be consistent regardless of the attack vector. You have to have proper controls in place, whether that is policy, the um, procedures on letting folks in, do they, are they required to provide a government ID? And, and in many cases, facilities do have that on paper, but uh, again, the implementation is difficult because now you're relying on people. Um, we have gotten in using fake badges that, that we gave in place of government IDs, and, and many times people want to be helpful, and if you are 
asking for something in a nice way, they will they'll want to help you and they'll want want you they'll want to help you steer them in a direction that's perhaps not in their best interest. And so I, I think that the clear indicators are that there need to be policies, there need to be technical controls in place because we're never going to say don't put locks on your doors. And finally there there have to be ways of testing enforcement of those policies because again the the most dangerous attackers know the route to take that don't involve breaking in, that just involve using a smile and a nice question to get someone in the door. Or pretty okay. things. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, alongside what Rob said earlier, um, they're about like bypassing technical control or bypassing controls that weren't actually in place. Like, I don't know how many times I've walked up to a front desk um, in another, not at Better Cloud, but you know, as a penetration tester walked up to a desk and they're and I'm like with coworkers and they're like, okay, I need your, you know, driver's license or whatever. And my coworkers provide driver's license and I just say like, oh yeah, I don't have mine. And so the person at the front desk is scanning in all these driver's license and producing badges and whatever program that they were using didn't require them to actually scan in a driver's license and they were able to just bypass that step and give me a badge anyway. And like that's a really clear example of like a place where you could have had a technical control in place that would have prevented somebody from getting in, you know, without bypassing whatever sort of logs they had. Okay, Chris, let's be realistic here. Okay, so the situation that Austin just described, you're going in and there's a security card, at, a security guard at the desk, and he or she is busy, and you know, you say, I'm just with him, I'm with her. We're not going to fix that problem easily, are we? We're, we're not, you know. And, and this, and I'm, I'm really glad you asked that because one of the cautions I give when uh, Michelle and I speak on this particular vector is it sounds like the only way to fix it is to make everyone untrusting, and that's a horrible piece of advice. We don't want that, right? A little bit of paranoia can keep us all safe, but the last thing you want is all your employees to stop trusting everybody. It's going to ruin business. It's going to make working together very horrible. So we, we don't. We don't suggest that. But in Austin's example, there was a clear fix there. The, they should not have been able to issue a badge without scanning the driver's license. So see, because the employee had the choice to bypass that, then the, the, um, the company gave the employee the ability to let kindness take over and not policy. So if the policy is every person gets a badge and to get a badge every person must show a government ID, then that should be enforced. That means that you cannot print a badge unless a driver's license was scanned inside the machine. And that now means that they can't bypass it. You can't possibly bypass the system. And we, we've done the same thing too where we've been into secure facilities where you, you have to have a badge and you, I walk up to even get in the elevator you have to have a badge and I've walked up and the thing rings, the alarm rings, and I've turned around and just kind of did this when, I don't know, and somebody has come up and went, oh, let me help you, and scanned their badge and let us through. And then said, oh, what floor are you going to? And put their badge in and got us to the floor, and I've never even said a word. All I did was shrug my shoulders and, like, do this. There, there, there's, 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 those things are there. They were protections, but they weren't enforceable policies. So if you make it that... I can't get through with someone else's badge, right? Uh, that a badge has to have a driver's license attached to it to be printed. Now you take away some of the ability for kindness to get in the way, but you don't take away people's kindness. And that, that's so, a really important um, differentiation there. Yeah, I'm glad you raised this. So, so Michelle, as IT folks, we're responsible for technology, but we're not, we're not and we can't be psychologists. And so, but she Chris, is, by the way. Oh, I really? <laughs> so, so you're saying that's the wrong person she actually is. So, <laughs> that's okay. the well, so, 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 from an IT standpoint, is it describe what's our what should our job, our role be in terms of making sure that we have the the governance, the policies, and the organizational support. So that they will, so that the company will invest in the kind of technical controls mm -hmm. and technical systems that Chris was just talking about. 
Wow, that is a really big <laughs> question, Michael. Thank you for directing that at me. Um, I, I, I didn't think, know you were um, a psychologist. Well, now, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we see this come up with our clients a lot. You know, we we have. Um, folks that are in the field and dealing with this every day and having the difficulty in pushing this uphill and having their leadership see the relevance because frankly investing in security is a lot like investing in insurance you know you're, you're paying for something and you're not going to see the returns unless something really bad happens and when that occurs it's a non-event and so being able to prove return on investment is is tricky and needs to be made very concrete in terms of the assets that the organization has has to lose if they don't invest. And for a lot of our clients, that is definitely still an uphill battle. I mean, if you think about the stories that everyone on this panel has told, they are, are all very similar. We aren't having to do really complicated attacks in order to be able to gain access to assets, to facilities, to information. So the problem, I think, that in terms of maturity is still it's still very early in its lifespan. And so I, I think we are starting to see, at least with Chris and I in our company, we're starting to see greater support from leadership. But really, it does come down to being able to demonstrate the risks associated. And unfortunately, a lot of senior leadership isn't necessarily learning, even from the breaches that we've had in the past year. If you think of just you know the top four or five that have been devastating and that have created you know, PlayStation and Anthem, all of these were relatively simple attacks. And they created just devastating outcomes for the companies. So unfortunately, it, it is still very much an uphill battle because we're still in our infancy in terms of what we need to be secure. And because so many people tend to be relatively concrete in terms of what is needed, if I buy a bright, shiny box and put it in my server room, that to me is much more concrete than talking about policies and making your population aware of principles of influence and the kinds of things that can be, the kinds of attacks that can be perpetrated. So that is a really long-winded question to say um, we are still working on it <laughs> in, in terms of, of security as, as, a, as a whole. Rob, what can an IT person do to get their, following from Michelle's comments, what can an IT person do to get the organization to invest in the technologies that will help prevent attacks short of waiting until the company is attacked and the payroll data is leaked on the internet. What can we do? Certainly. Please elaborate on Michelle's comments. <clears throat> to kind of to, to extend what, what Michelle said and, and extend the, on, the, on the problem, being very strategic and thinking about what the long-term plan is for defending against social engineering attacks because it's not a question of preventing it it's it's a matter of mitigating it and these aren't going away they're always going it's always going to be a constant threat and some of the the more mature organizations that we're seeing be very successful uh, are, are treating it as an, an extension of their incident response plan and they're making very customized incident response methodologies for the, the types of attacks they're seeing the most often or the, the types that they, they want to invest the most in mitigating. And if they can map out what their plan is to prepare for these specific attacks, to identify them, then as a next step to contain them and to eradicate the threat and recover from the incident and they're able to demonstrate this to management and outline in detail the steps for if someone calls a customer support representative and, and tries to convince them to, to perform an account takeover, here are the precise steps that we're, we're, we're going to follow to identify, contain, and recover from this type of an event. And then here is where we recommend making improvements to our policies, our process, and our technical controls. And here is the return on investment where we're seeing that we've increased our rate of, uh, we've performed training and we've increased the rate of people reporting the incident. We're not just tracking who's clicked or who's, who, who's fallen victim to these and expecting that number to go down with more training, but we're, we're actually seeing the number of reported incidents go up. And that way, we're then able to initiate this incident response process and, and supplement it with these, these controls that, that holistically create this defense and death strategy uh, against these, these specific social engineering attacks. Um, and we're seeing that be very effective in convincing management to, to invest more. 
Fantastic. Can I add something to that too, Michael? Yeah, really quickly, Chris, because you're up okay. next and we need you to tell us about uh, smishing. But yes, please, final comments um, on this one. So what, what, I, what I liked about uh, what, what Rob was just saying is, is that I think that a lot of the industry doesn't focus on more metrics, uh, so that's an important piece. Right, they focus just on click ratio, but click ratio is a useless statistic when it comes to fishing alone because you can get anyone to click anything with the right pretext, right? And click ratios can vary by the month. So focusing just on one thing like click ratio is not going to really help your company. But um, in addition to the metrics, the way that you show metrics are moving in the proper direction is by effective user training. So if your user training is focusing just on click ratio or how many times someone didn't let someone in without a badge, those things are going to be very hollow in themselves. But if you have a robust user education program that is testing all vectors and all avenues and you have a better way to grab metrics like who's reporting and who's not clicking, who's reporting and who is clicking, those kinds of things, now you can see those metrics move in the, in the proper direction. Fantastic. You guys are just a, a wealth of knowledge. So we've spoken about phishing, vishing, impersonation, and now it's time for smishing. <laughs> and Chris, I want to know who comes up with these names, by the way. I, you know, if I meet the guy, I'll let you know. I have no clue who, who I, I'm just assuming that, you know, because it was phishing was first. And by the way, vishing made it into the Oxford Dictionary in 2015 as a real word. So my goal is this year to get smishing in the dictionary. So I think that would just be fantastic. All right, tell, but, us about, uh, tell us about smishing. So smishing, uh, you know, it kind of went away for a while. For a couple years it went away, and now it's back. Um, and, and it's basically phishing through text message or phishing through SMS. And, and there's a few reasons why I feel that we're seeing an increase in this. Is uh, One, BYOD or bring your own device policies are huge. A lot of companies have no issue with people bringing their own device. And that means that whatever someone is doing on their off time with their device, can affect your company, right? If someone's downloading every screensaver or downloading pornography or downloading whereas or pirated music or books, those things could be infected and now they're bringing that device to your network and allowing it on your network. Second is our phones, I don't know about yours, but my phone is like a mini computer. It's actually like a big computer and everything is on it, right? We're doing our banking, our email, our contact management. We're doing document sharing, file sharing, all on our phones. So attackers have learned, hey, if I can compromise this guy's phone, I'm going to have access to everything, his personal email, his work email, his bank data, his credit card data. And then you take this a step further and how many phones have come with things like Apple Pay or Google Pay. And I can't even believe this is a real thing and I'm going to say this out loud. But there's people who will put all of their credit card numbers into their NFC portion of their phone so they can just tap their phone on their little things and pay for their coffee at Starbucks. And that means if I can compromise this device, I now have access to all of your credit card data in addition to all the other things I mentioned. So smishing is a big, huge vector that is, I, I believe we, we haven't seen even the start of how much damage it's going to cause, and we're going to start seeing that more so now. So shadow IT, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, shadow, shadow IT, and devices. Um, wow, Michelle, what do we do? How do we? What do we do? <laughs> I feel like a broken record, Michael. <laughs> you know, again, we, we we need to set up proper user training. We need to be able to set up good reporting, a reporting structure that that makes sense and gives your incident response the ability to to take care of issues even when they're already on your network. And that's something that I think um, all of us sort of understand and I think it's important to explicitly state is that even after an incident occurs, our users need to be trained to report. I think there's some embarrassment or you know, some fear over getting in trouble, but really <clears throat> you're going to hamstring, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to hamstring your incident re response if your people don't have the ability to report safely and to report accurately. And so many times there are companies and clients that we service that, that don't even have a mechanism in place. So whether it is a phishing, impersonation, smishing attack, they don't know how and when to report. And oftentimes that stuff just gets sort of shoved under the table. Or if a reporting mechanism is so bulky and unwieldy and it'll take me 15 minutes out of my day to report, I'm not going to do that either. 
So again, what do we do about it? We train our people appropriately, we give them the tools to be able to detect intrusion, and we give them the ability to report so that the security folks can respond in an appropriate fashion. On top of that, um, I would say like we've had a fair amount of success recently at Better Cloud telling people like, hey, you get something strange, like a weird email or a weird text or a weird whatever, send it to, you know, this email address. And we've gotten, we got, you know, a trickle of responses at first, and I started congratulating people like, hey, this is, this is really interesting, this is definitely fake, here's how you can see it was fake, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to send this to me, you did a good job. It's like, using that positive, positive affirmation, it just exploded in how popular, like, people aren't, like, looking for opportunities to send me stuff, and I'm not, like, gushing over and being fake or anything. But like, I'm really congratulating people for like, hey, this is really good that you caught this. I'm you have a good eye, that sort of thing. And then people will forward me stuff all day long, um, sending me stuff and like, hey, this looks fake. Is it? And I reply back, yes, no. And even if it's a no, it's like, hey, this is not fake. But you know, good on you for being. I can see why you were paranoid about it. And that's kind of created this positive culture of, of reporting. Of, like that works easier to roll out at a smaller company than a large one but the same principles still apply. Okay. Rob, so is IT then, in addition to doing all the, the technical things that IT has to do, is IT now becoming part of sort of the, the rah-rah department where we're <laughs> doing what Austin was just describing? Is that the role of IT? Is that? I think it's really important to uh, for for IT representatives to build partnerships with other groups and other organizations and other management uh, in order to um, help uh, incentivize it. And I think Austin's uh, approach is is really catching on. Rather than than taking um, the the approach of the hammer, uh, having having this this carrot based approach, we're seeing uh, a lot of more proactive organizations uh, follow that uh, rather than being um, involved in a, in a group that's, that's going to fire uh, people for, for being re repeat offenders. Um, we're actually seeing a lot more proactive organizations um, build incentivized programs or, or doing gamification of uh, reporting incidents and, and giving, actually giving out rewards for the, the groups and the organizations and other departments that are reporting the most incidents. Um, this, uh, this does effectively um, create a, a security positive culture and uh, representatives from IT can, can best accomplish that by, by building those partnerships with other management in order to, to make this most effective. Chris, Andre Barboros, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right and I apologize if I'm not, asks, how can, what is the best way of teaching non-IT, non-technical staff to recognize these types of attacks, some of which we know are so subtle and so carefully crafted, it's very difficult. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, Michelle and I have this analogy we like to use that if you took a complete novice and they wanted to learn how to box, and you took them to a boxing gym, and the instructor put them down in front of a 20-minute CBT, and then said, hey, you're ready to be a boxer. You'd laugh them all the way out of the gym and you'd never get in the ring. But that's what we're doing with our people many times and it's not effective. But what's effective is all the suggestions that we've heard here today from, from the whole panel is actually testing them by vishing them, fishing them, smishing them, having a guy break into the building and having not just the IT people involved. Do a vishing call or a phishing email on everybody in the company. Um, have have vishing calls done randomly throughout the month uh, to employees, and it will touch more than just the IT groups. And when people start to realize, oh, that was a vishing call or that was a phishing email, they become more aware. And I truly, truly love Austin's methodology um, of using positive reinforcement because any time we all know this, anyone who has kids, fear and punishment don't work as well as positive affirmation. And and when you mix good training with positive um, influence in the back, you have a win-win situation. You create a really strong uh, security culture. And frankly, something that's important to remember is that malicious attackers, again, rely on manipulation. And so if there is a request that comes in that makes you extremely anxious or fearful, you know, most of those requests, they, they threaten an account shutoff or police action or a fine. So many of those 
rely on those kinds of methods that make us think quickly without thinking through critically. And so one way to recognize, one way to help recognize a malicious attack is to think about the request and if it really makes you feel strongly, if you are enraged or in terror or humiliated in some way and that makes you want to comply with the request, that's something worth thinking about and that's something that we teach all of our populations is to just take an extra minute to think about why this request is affecting you so emotionally. So that's one quick way that, that we teach our populations to recognize possibly a malicious attack. Now we've spoken about these four different types of attacks and we spoke a little bit earlier about what happens when there are multiple attacks happening simultaneously. For example, a vishing uh, on a voicemail along with or, or a phone call along with a phishing attack on email. Does anybody have examples of when multiple attack vectors were combined to uh, really cause problems for an organization? You want one from ben like the wild or you mean one from penetration testing? Uh, where an example that, that you can think of where an organization was attacked in multiple ways and to just describe the, the type of attack and describe what happened. Yeah, so where this became really popular was um, a few years ago with the term Francophoning because it happened to some organizations in France where the attacker would get on the phone with a target and then say, hey, this is uh, Paul from uh, um, um, AR. I'm, I'm about to send you an invoice. I need you to check it because it's got your name on it. And as they were talking, the phishing email would come into the box. The person would get the email, look at it, be on the phone with someone who identified themselves from the accounting department. They would not read and do all the security stuff they were taught, like hover and look at the who and from and all of that. And they would just open the attachment and it would crash. And they would say, hey, Paul, this, this crashed. I don't know what am I supposed to do. Uh, you know what, I'm just heading out to lunch. Just delete that email. I'll send you another one after lunch and I'll call you back. The person deletes the email and thinks that they're safe because, you know, they moved on. And unfortunately, that was the attacker getting a uh, remote connection to their machine. And this happened multiple times. And these were part of what's called BEC scams, uh, ba the banking scams, because they were trying to get in to get banking information from these targets using a multiple uh, phishing slash vishing vector. Other examples from anybody of multiple vectors simultaneously applied. What I really would, what I what I want to do is is help the help put it together for the audience, all the pieces together. Yeah, we we've certainly used those exact types of uh, techniques in our penetration testing efforts, where we're um, a combination of uh, physical access. Uh, perhaps we're cloning people's RFID badges. Uh, or tailgating, or picking locks, getting into a facility, leaving a, uh, a pwn plug, which is a small computer that, that looks like a power adapter, um, plugged into the wall, perhaps in a conference room or, or in, in a, a training area. Um, we, we may even leave a note on it that says, uh, do not touch with the name of someone that works there. Uh, and um, and uh, combining that with uh, actually getting on the phone with folks, uh, spoofing an email from someone at the organization calling uh, is spoofing our phone number to be in the same area code and block of, of their office line numbers and uh, pr pretending to be that, that person from IT support, walking them through um, installing a, a malicious backdoor on their systems and uh, actually walking them through uh, closing any warnings uh, from, from antivirus or any other uh, pop-ups that, that may be um, uh, blocking, uh, blocking our attack and, and just using combination uh, of, of all of these manipulation techniques with impersonation techniques with um, uh, technical attacks uh, in order to gain access to our target assets is very often uh, what we employ. It's, it's usually not just one technique. We have only a few minutes left and what I think we should do as a, as a finish is let's go in turn starting with Austin, and just very briefly, because we don't have much time, give us your distilled insight and advice on how to create a security smart culture as a means of preventing these kinds of attacks. Okay, I would say 
Um, number one priority is get top-down support. So for us, we've had a lot of success at getting C-level executives not, not really sort of mentally signed off on like, hey, security is a big issue. Our customers care about it, so that means we care about it, so that means my employees care about it. And then from there, you know, rolling out security programs, like helping people lock their laptops, not respond to phishing emails, that sort of thing. And then anytime anybody um, feels like, uh, I don't know, too much change in the culture at once, we can point back to top-down support and say, like, look, these people believe it's important, and therefore it's now part of our jobs to co sort of comply with, you know, have to lock your computer every time you get up, or you have to, you know, not put in your password when it's not, you know, a, a place where you shouldn't be putting in your password. Great. Chris, in less than a minute, your distilled advice. Uh, to add on to Austin's, I think um, really strong multi-vector user education that is real-life testing. So not, I think CBTs have their place, but I think um, actual real-life phishing, vishing, smishing, and impersonation attacks on your population can help teach them what it feels like to be in the ring. Rob. As information security practitioners, our goal is to create uh, protection, a form of protection where there's a separation between our assets and the threat. And I think it's very important to think strategically and long term about what the security strategy is uh, and what the security culture of the organization is going to be. Um, it, looking holistically at, at creating a defense in depth plan that involves least privilege for our, our between our users and our sensitive assets. Um, creating as many layers of, uh, of separation and defense uh, with, with, our, with our technical controls, building in a security awareness and, and training as, as a mechanism for uh, triggering an, an event and an incident that the security team can respond to, and then having that detailed plan and methodology for, for dealing with both uh, successful attacks and attacks in progress uh, as part of a, a, a targeted incident response uh, program. Uh, and then building out uh, the, the specific organization goals uh, and roadmap um, uh, over for, for the next few years is, is an excellent way to prepare. Fantastic. And Michelle, your distilled wisdom of everything you know into one <laughs> minute of advice. Well, I think these gentlemen have summed it up very, very nicely. So the one thing that I will add is the importance of consistency. We want to have consistent policies in place. We want to have consistent reporting. We want to have consistent training and education. These are decisions that your population has to make on a daily basis, whether that is to let someone in the door, whether that is to click a fish, whether that is to provide sensitive information over the phone. So if you are in this situation where you're taking care of your population, you have to provide consistent support to your folks to ensure they always know what to do and it is very clear and their reactions are very clear. And again, you know, as much as possible, take the ability to make mistakes out of the situation. Let's take one or two questions and James Rich asks, he gets survey calls all the time with people asking, what kind of equipment do you have here or there? And he says he's, he's getting nervous that they're, it's part of an attack. Is he being too paranoid, or is his fear over this realistic? He's not up. too paranoid. <laughs> I don't believe it's paranoid at all, and in fact, um, the thing that's really important to understand is that once we step over a behavioral boundary, once we comply on a very small level, we may give out an initial piece of information that is very minimal and wouldn't be damaging at all, but once we've done that, it's really difficult for us as human beings to decide where to stop helping and very skillful social engineers know how to escalate their requests. And so something that starts out very small can gradually lead to something that is much more damaging, and so I would absolutely have concern over those kinds of inquiries coming into the organization. Okay, fantastic. Wow, what an amazing uh, conversation and group of experts. You have been watching Better Clouds cloud IT webinar series, and today we've been talking about social engineering. Our guests have been Chris Hagnagy, who is the founder and 
CEO of social-engineer.com. We've been talking with his colleague, Michelle Fincher, who is the chief influencing agent of social-engineer.com. Rob Reagan, who is managing security associate at Bishop Fox. And last but not least, Austin Whipple, who is the senior application security engineer at Better Cloud. I'm Michael Krigsman, the founder of CXO Talk, cxotalk.com. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for everybody who asks questions. And a big round of applause for Better Cloud for making it possible for us to have this great conversation today. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a wonderful day. The webinar will be available, and Better Cloud is going to get in touch, and they're going to ask you a few, a few poll questions as well. So when you get those poll questions from Better, from Better Cloud, those are not an attack. Please answer them, and, <laughs> and you'll be able to enjoy the replay. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.